Hey everybody, Nicole here with Cellbotics, and I have some a really exciting guests with me. Um, so I have Matt. Uh, he is actually the VP of the Right to Repair Association. And so I'm really excited to have him on here. I have some questions for him. And um, but I want to give him a minute just to talk about what he does and um, just give you guys a brief overview of the right to repair in case you haven't heard of it, if you've been under a rock somewhere. But um, Matt, what would you like to, to tell? Um, this is going to be on our YouTube channel and in our course. So what would you like people to know about the right to repair? If they've never heard of it. Yeah, uh, thanks for the invitation, Nicole. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, my name is Matt Zeminski. I'm the vice president for the Repair Association. We are a trade association. Um, we've been around since uh, 2014, 2013, in some way, shape, or form. And we are focusing on passing what's called fair repair legislation. Um, this would be a law in your state, depending on where you live. Um, that would tell manufacturers that they have to provide you with the um, access to purchase the OEM parts, access to the OEM service manuals, access to OEM tools, um, all of that you currently may not be able to get, or if you can get it, it's probably on what you might refer to as the black market. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we want to do is make sure that you have access to that in a way that is um, legal and also gives you some certainty and guarantee as to the quality and the um, reliability of that information. Um, so what we do is we go to every single state and, and including some federal uh, committees and including some international committees, and we push for that legislation to be passed um, in, in each state. We also uh, go in front of various standards committees for regulations. Um, so things like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which um, is a law that was passed in the 90s to say uh, you or I cannot um, hack uh, or sorry, jailbreak our uh, game consoles or our cell phones and stuff. Those types of things were covered under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And, and so what we do is we go in front of Congress, we go in front of the Library of Congress, we go in front of whatever committee is talking about it. And we say, no, repair technicians need access to this type of material. And they need access to be able to do this type of thing, right? So you can think of it kind of a little bit twofold. One is laws. We're trying to pass that law with right to repair, fair repair laws. The other one is regulation changes, where we're trying to change existing laws to carve out exemptions for fair repair practices. Okay. okay. Great. All right. Awesome. Um, so my question, one of my questions was, I've got a mat in here. Should I make this? Um, wait, how, ideally, how does the right to repair think it would be best to deliver the materials? Is it going to be like they work, like ideally in your vision, like a right to repair's vision, like how would Apple and Samsung and all of these manufacturers give access to all that material? Would it be to the stores or would it be like something that comes with the phone uh, like that the user has? Like, like you know how like you get a car and there's a manual inside there or something like that? Would it be like that? Or is it something where somehow you want um, stores or repair technicians to be able to um, work with the manufacturers to get those directly? Like what is the vision behind that? Because that's one thing I didn't understand. I was not really clear about it. And I've heard people say both. So I'm like, well, what is the real thing? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I imagine you probably hear both because we're not too prescriptive about the way in which it's provided. Um, you know, so one thing I like to, to caution um, people on is, is our piece of legislation does not say that Apple has to give it away. Um, and they don't say that um, they have to sell it at a certain price. All they say is they have to make it accessible, right? And and it's accessible to consumers as well as professionals, right? And so, okay. you know, spitballing here um, in in what I personally envision it is that you have a a customer facing portal where you can go and download the service manual for your iPhone, and you can take a stab at that from Apple as a part of your ownership of your iPhone. But if you can't do it then you go to your repair shop, um, or if you don't want to do it, you go to your repair shop and you ask them to do it for you. And that repair shop has access to the same information. And the difference in, in the example of Apple and the difference between this scenario and like the independent repair program that they have set up yeah. is that it's not quote unquote pay to play, right? You don't have to follow what Apple says is appropriate in order to have access to those materials. It's 
you are a repair technician. The consumer has selected you as their authorized representative, and now you have access to those materials, right? And the, and the other piece of why this is important, even in the face of whatever Apple has implemented with the independent repair program and the authorized service program, and, and not just Apple, but other OEMs as well. The other piece that's really important is that at any point when Apple decides they don't want to do this anymore, they can pull the plug and then your repair shops are screwed, right? And that's why we want to make something enshrined in law is that it's a lot harder for those types of things to be taken away from businesses and from consumers if it's enshrined in the code of law, right? And, and it's not just up to the whims of the manufacturer. And we've seen this play out in, in the past. We've seen it. Apple has pulled a Mac repair authorized service program in the past, left many Mac repair stores stranded. Uh, you've seen like Nikon, um, they uh, pulled their service centers for cameras that left consumers stranded, right? And so because of history, and you can think about TV repair, vacuum repair, because of history, we now know that we need to push for legislation to get this done. That's why it's still important, despite whatever program has been set up in the, the past couple of years in response to this legislation. I see what you're saying. So, because these are the different opinions that I'm that because I've talked to so many people about it, it seems to always come up when no matter what person I'm talking to, if it's someone thinking of taking our class, if it's someone who's got 10 stores, like right to repair is always something that comes up and people have such a wide view on it. Yeah. What does what what in your view, how does that affect if someone's right now watching this video and they are thinking about going into phone repair. I mean, if Apple gives access to all the purchasers of the equipment, access to like repair manuals and things like that, is how does that affect? I know that we can get in, you know, of course, like we teach our people, you know, there is levels to repair. You start a beginner, then, you know, within a year or two, you want to do micro soldering. And then after that, you need to do refurb. Like we give them, when they come to class, we give them a roadmap to where they end up doing everything. Um, but what will happen, you know, what do you think it will have an effect if the user is having access to all of that as far as a business or will it help us or will, I mean, can be both? I think it'll be both. Um, so, you know, consumers, I, I remember hearing this argument a lot in, in some past jobs that I had where it was, you know, you're teaching my customers how to do my job. And so you're taking away my business. Um, and, and that's like a valid concern, but the reality is if a customer is DIY minded, they're going to figure out how to go about it themselves. Anyways, sure. we're, we're not <laughs> gatekeepers. Um, you can go to youtube.com and search right. for a repair <laughs> life phone. We get yeah. tons of students from there. <laughs> Damage right. stuff. Um, and no, YouTube is not the place to go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I would say like, what's going to happen is we're going to elevate the standards in the industry for what it means to be a cell phone repair technician or, you know, broadly a consumer electronics repair technician. It's, it. you know, when this industry for phone repair really took off in, you know, 2007, 2008 with the introduction of the iPhone, there was no barrier to entry. And, and we faced that as business owners, we faced that problem where you had people coming in with a $3 iPhone uh, three screen that, you know, failed after one use. And then the customer wrote off all of these repair shops as scams, right? And, and what happened over time is the industry kind of forced a higher level of standard that then consumers expected as well. That's be the same thing that happens when this legislation passes is we will have consumers have access to the, the, the materials, repair shops have access to the materials, and we'll have kind of a higher standard of what repair shops can and should be delivering to consumers. I see what you're right? saying. Yeah, it may not be as simple as screen repairs. It may be something more complex. It may be micro soldering or board level right. repair. Mm -hmm. um, but there's always going to be a need for that professional. Well, I mean, because even changing a power button, you could give someone a manual, but that's hard. And you don't need soldering to do that, but it's not easy. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's just like if, if somebody has a manual to fix their car, doesn't or it doesn't mean they're going to get down there and actually change a tire or change their brakes. You know what I mean? So um, I get that, too. That does make sense um, now that I'm hearing your side and um, just, you know, that's what I was thinking. I was like, ah, they could get access, but are they or is everybody all of a sudden come fixing their own phone? I, I just don't think so. You know what I mean? So I think that's a fear that we really have to get out of people's mind because it's probably every day I'm getting calls or messages. Um, is it too late? Is the industry going away? Is it? And I'm like, it's not going away. It may change 
it may mutate and you have to grow with it. Like we have for years. I mean, even when I got in just a decade ago, which isn't actually that long ago, I've changed so much since then. So it's like, you just kind of change with it and adapt with it. Um, so if someone wanted to support the right to repair, now I know we were in Vegas and I heard Lewis speak, which was great. And he was talking about uh, customer awareness and all this. So I was like trying to be creative and come up with a document or something and put some wording on there. And I'm just going to be giving that away for free. Basically people can just kind of have maybe a script or something that they add a part of their intake process, maybe just to educate customers. Do you think it's best to do that? Like talk to every customer about, I think he said, um, how far away you were from not being able to get this repair done or something like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think um, keying on kind of something that you said about how it changes and it evolves over time, um, you know, we're going to have to rethink what our relationship is with consumers. Uh, it, it honestly, it cannot be, um, it, it cannot be transactional anymore. It has to be more personal and we have to strive to develop those relationships with consumers and a part of that is explaining to them what you're doing and what the alternative would have been if you didn't exist right when we um speak to legislators uh in the state houses in the united states um, we often remind the their representatives that this is not impacting the lobbyists for apple that are sitting in the other room this is impacting the consumers this is impacting their constituents who are local. This is impacting business owners, right? And when you frame it in that perspective that Joe down the street, who's my dad's best friend who does cell phone repair is gonna be uh, harmed if this legislation doesn't pass, it changes the perspective, right? And, and part of that is that Joe's dad started to build a relationship with his community, which then made it much more impactful and important, right? And so I think, um, you know, what we want repair shops to do, and we want to support them in whatever ways we can, is, is teach them how to provide that information to consumers. Here's what I'm doing. Here's why it matters. Um, and also to teach them kind of push back against some of the narrative that exists out there, right? We've heard that um, independent repair shops are unnecessary. We've heard that they are not to be trusted. We've heard unless, um, you know, they pass Apple's IRP program, they are insufficient, right? And right. none of that is true. I mean, Cellbotics right. train wonderful technicians all right. the time. And, right. and we just have to push back on that notion that a technician is a technician and the industry holds them to a standard and the market holds them to a standard, but that's not necessarily determined by, or shouldn't be determined by one OEM, right? It shouldn't right. be centralized power there. Um, we make some material for shops to use available for free on our website, um, repair.org slash brochure. Oh, nice. okay. I was yeah. just going to ask that next. Glad you said that. <laughs> I was yeah. say, do you have something they can print out or posters or something? Cause that'd be pretty cool in your lobby. You know what I mean? So yeah. that's great. Um, but they also can support financially. So if they want to donate or something and there's something there on your website where they can do that. And if they want to get more involved, is there anything else that they can do to really, because a lot of people are like, well, what do I do? Just yeah. one person, you know what I mean? Yeah, the biggest, you know, um, the biggest thing they can do uh, if they have the time and the energy to do it is go to whatever your state name is, dot repair.org and get in touch with your constituent and just tell them your story. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can just be, you know, how you repaired uh, so-and-so's uh, cell phone and it had a big impact on that person. Just telling your 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 representatives um, stories that are compelling has more of an impact in in many ways than a um, hundred thousand dollars can. Right? It it wow. does have a big impact. And you know, I'll give you an example. I when I was doing cell phone repair um, as more of a business back, uh, I guess it would be about ten years ago almost. Um, I repaired a, a woman's phone whose son was killed in a flash flood oh, and, um, she brought me his phone and it was caked in mud and she just wanted to get access to the memories, the photos that were on there, um, to memorialize him and Apple, uh, and the Apple, uh, certified center at Best Buy turned her away and said it couldn't be salvaged. And I did it right. And I got her that information. But if we had trusted just the OEM, um, source there, 
she would never have received that information. And right? there's tons of stories like that. I mean, yeah. I've personally had them walk in here and say, oh, the, the Apple said this couldn't be fixed or whatever, you know? I, I mean, I'm not anti-Apple. Like I never, everybody knows that I'm kind of like, I feel like I'm in this very weird middle place where I'm like, I think we should work with manufacturers somehow and this information should be provided somehow to technicians, but we're not having to do like the IRP program, you know what I mean? And and it should be like a, a triangle, you know, we got right to repair the manufacturers and technicians, like we should all work together. I don't, I don't feel like it's, to me, it's not like this, you know, even though it's in court, yeah. I don't feel like it's like, we hate you manufacturer, give us everything. Like it's not, we're not trying to take them hostage because they do have a proprietary product that they developed, you know what I mean? So we yeah. want to respect that, but at the same time, you got to be able to fix it and, and you can't, and there's such a big company and I, I think they know that, I mean, they, I mean, they can't just get rid of the whole repair industry. Like they can barely even service where they are now, you know what I mean? Let alone, you know, and not everybody's going to upgrade, but you know, that's a whole nother conversation, I, I guess, but. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I always like to point out that there are certain OEMs that have been relatively very good on right to repair mm -hmm. um, Dell, Microsoft, right. um, I think uh, if I remember right, it fix, I fix it has partnerships with uh, Acer, Lenovo, some other, you know, like there's no reason why they can't work more yeah. with um, independent repair in, in a way that's different than like having a centralized independent repair program. Um, it's just their, their choice not to, right? And so, you know, one of the things I like to remind people is um, with right to repair legislation, the big win is obviously going to be getting a bill passed in, in any one state because we think that is the domino that tips all the other 50 states, right? Um, but that aside, I think sometimes what's not recognized by the industry is the small iterative gains we have over time, right? Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, five years ago, we didn't have the Apple IRP program we maybe didn't even have access to the screws that Apple was using in their phones or certain other vendors were using in, in their devices, right? Those things have changed over time, right? As I mentioned earlier, we didn't have access to jailbreak and unlock phones prior to uh, the last, um, you know, six, seven years. So like those things are gains and wins that we have partially because we've pursued those in, in regulatory changes but also partially because the OEMs could see the writing on the wall and they could say, we just want to change to get ahead of the problem, right? right. And so sometimes what I encourage your listeners and anybody that's viewing this to think about is sometimes the, the success of the right to repair movement can be felt in ways other than just legislation, right? It's convincing our culture that we want to treat repair as your primary option and not just jumping to go and replace your unit when it stops working, whatever that unit may be, right? Okay. So, and that's what I've seen a lot of progress on. Um, and I would argue like, if you ask, what have we done in the last five, 10 years? It's been like our biggest accomplishment has been shifting OEM perspectives on how to treat independent repair providers and also how to um, provide access to consumers to those options because neither of those things existed before. Right, yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, this is great. I mean, I feel like this is really informative and it's definitely opened my eye to see a little bit more what the bigger picture is. And because I was really confused, like I wanted to hear it from the source, like so tired of hearing the different opinions, you know? Um, and so you guys are hearing it here, what the overall picture is and how you can help out, engage with your customers, let them know what's going on, um, you know, put some posters up, um, you know, you, it doesn't have to be monetary, you know? Oh, and and there was one more thing um, because you had mentioned about telling your reps for your state, right? Letting them know your story. It, it, there was some people that were talking about they were scared to do that because they're worried that Apple would find out and then they would be somehow harassed by Apple or, you know, like there may be, you know, issues that would arise for, for them for fixing them or ordering parts, you know. Do you think that's really a concern that they should have or... I've not heard of any direct um, kind of repercussions for any business that has spoken out in favor of right to repair. Okay. Um, I would say it's different to talk to your representative in a private meeting or in a private email or in, you know, it's different to do that than it is to submit official on the record testimony as well. Okay. Um, so if, if you're super concerned about that, 
you can have a phone call or send a letter um, to your representative, that information is is not published uh, on, you know, in, in, a, in a sense where uh, like a, an Apple could consume that, right? right. That information um, just goes straight to your representative for their consideration. So I think there's ways to get around that. Um, I also think it's kind of like an overblown um, fear. Um, yeah. You know, I've not, I've not heard of any okay. company punished because of that. I'd be curious if anybody was, um, I would imagine there's some legal repercussions if they did that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's probably, um, conspiracy driven, you know, like maybe, you know, it's a lot of people just live in fear and they, they get on these chats and they talk about all these different what ifs, you know, and you know, it's not too bad. So yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Huh? What'd you say? I was, I I was being sarcastic. I said, are you saying that what's on the internet isn't always true? Right. (laughs) Right. Yes. <laughs> That's so true. Well, guys, I'm going to link everything below this video that he talked about. I'll go grab some links off your website so you guys can check it out. Matt, thank you so much for your time. I know you're so, so busy over there doing all that great stuff. If there's any way that we can help or be more a part of it, definitely let me know. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Appreciate right. it. Thank uh, you. Bye. Bye. Have a great day.